Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our Design Considerations for Lithium Batteries Used in Portable Devices webinar today. Uh, my name is Ed McMahon, and I'm the CEO here at Epic. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let you know that you'll all be muted during the presentation. Um, if you have any questions as we move through, go ahead and enter them into the questions panel that's located in the webinar control panel, and then at the end, uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. If we don't have time to get through all the questions, uh, we'll, sure, we'll be sure to reply back to you uh, by email and we'll post uh, all of the answers uh, online. Along with that, as usual, we'll be recording the, the webinar and posting uh, that and the slides on our website and YouTube channels um, for anybody to share uh, if they find that this uh, presentation is, um, is productive and informative. Uh, our, pres our presenter today is Randy Ibrahim. Our, our battery development consultant. And Randy has been active within the battery and battery charger industry since 1986. Um, you know, since Randy joined uh, with Epic here about seven years ago, we've done over 50 designs for portable uh, electronic devices. Uh, and Randy brings a, a, just a whole different and slew of experience uh, into this business. He's been doing it for over 30 years. Um, and it, everything from uh, medical, military, to, um, to even uh, wheelchairs and other uh, vehicle devices. Um, his work in pioneering the development of uh, custom safety circuits and battery chargers for unique application in chemistries has gotten him a couple of patents. Um, and he's written numerous articles for industry trade publications. So uh, this is Randy's, I think, second or third uh, webinar that we've done. Every one of them has been, has been well received and been very informative. Uh, so without uh, any further ado, I'll pass it over to Randy. All right, thank you, Ed. Thank you. Oh, there's the echo there. Oh, it's gone. All right, what uh, we'd like to cover today is um, is what goes into a specification and how can we turn this specification into a product and why is that important. Uh, also, understanding the how the physical and environmental uh, requirements affect the design. And also uh, touch on some of the major cost drivers of uh, the final battery, and which is also used to power the device, and also safety systems uh, used to protect the battery during operation, also charging, and, and why those are important. And then we like to also cover smart batteries. Uh, what are they? They seem a little confusing, but what does this all really mean? First of all, the most important, this is why it's one of the first uh, topics here, is creating a specification. A specification is absolutely necessary for the success of a project, any project. It could be your host system, it could be a battery, anything in this. It could be like building a house. <laughs> you need house plans. It'd be like if you were building a house and you had all this concrete delivered, all the wood delivered, and all these workers, that want to get paid for their time, and they're all sitting there looking at each other like, okay, what are we building? And if you didn't have plans, um, I guarantee your project, your house would completely fail. You'd have massive cost overruns, but it's going to be a lot of redos. It's not any different when designing a battery or your host system. It's This is a, a time where it's, it's crucial, and I believe a lot of companies and a lot of people do not put enough effort up front where it's absolutely cheap. And uh, it's really um, uh, important to lay out all the performance specs at the very start of the project. And because this is a time where it's only paper, or computer keystrokes, and the only thing spent is time. You're not redoing uh, hardware, what have you. You can get it right. And it, it, we view it as a huge investment on return on the time spent. A specification provides a full understanding of the requirements up front before development begins. It's, it's really crucial that it uh, provides a clear and concise direction. And also this allows a dialogue to open up between the customer and ourselves to be able to really, one, educate the customer, and two, really update uh, the customer with what's the latest technology, what's possible, or what don't you want to do, and really have that dialogue. And, and as I said, this is the inexpensive time of a project to, uh, to get all that out, push, sort through it all, and figure out what do you really want from this battery? What's it required to do? In the long run, it definitely reduces the waste uh, in time and in cost and changes. Uh, as we all know, 
uh, as you start going with the hardware layout and spending a lot of engineering time, tests at the end of a project, uh, any change that, that happens late in the late stages of a project uh, develop, uh, turns into a massive amount of cost, cost and we got to make sure that that doesn't happen. And also a very well laid out and well thought uh, thought out specification uh, allows those surprises at the end of this project. And no one likes surprises, uh, uh, especially customers and uh, ourselves, because we don't we don't want to disappoint. So what's really nice is these specifications, if, if if done correctly, you can actually use it as a incoming inspection document or more of a design verification document, where we are testing against it making sure our battery meets the requirements that were laid out in this plan and you can as well test and you know what you're testing and what to expect and if anything is, is not uh, uh, correct then it's a good starting talking point to uh, to drill down and see what, what the issue is. Also um, one thing that's over overlooked a lot of times is it's not just the battery we're building or it, you know we sure we have okay it has to have this voltage that's current you know this capacity that's all fine and great. However, this has to work within your system. It has to fit within your system, has to plug in it with your system, has to mate with your connectors, everything. So it goes well beyond the battery, the specification. It actually has to uh, work with the handshaking that's involved, and, and that ultimately uh, ends up in a seamless type integration between the battery and your system. Physical and electrical interface and environmental aspects must be defined. This is crucial. It has really needed for proper cell selection. We have hundreds of cells available to us. Uh, and there's a reason why there's hundreds. Everyone performs slightly different. Maybe it's temperature, maybe it's power, current, capacity, uh, size, physical shape, a number of things. We need to know uh, what the physical, electrical aspect in the environmental, because proper cell selection is paramount early in the project, and it needs to be done correctly. Uh, any any reviews, and also we need to understand how robust the circuits and enclosure need to be, and this is defined by the environment. Are there 22 foot drop tests required? Well, we better have a pretty sturdy enclosure if that's required, and that's required on aircraft carrier decks. Uh, there could be, uh, the say, the same battery is going flying onto a flight deck of aircraft here and it has to fly through a radar a sweep. You better have some good DMC uh, capabilities within that battery, and we've done that where we create Faraday cages of sandwich between six layers of board and protecting all sorts of traces. Uh, we don't like adding that cost if it's not necessary. That's why it's very important to understand the physical and environmental aspects. Digging a little deeper here, uh, there are many factors and uh, of how the physical environmental uh, you know, requires to affect the design. First of all, how big is this battery? Is it an EV battery that we're doing in a car or a, a scooter? Or is it something very small? Is it something that fits on the tip of your uh, fingernail? And it's really important to understand the physical size of the battery and where we're going with this. Um, and also, it, it's uh, Important, it's also important to understand if it's power or energy cell or both. And you know, just recently on, on TV, I was watching. There's a commercial that came up. I believe it was like a Duracell commercial. Uh, commercial. And there's a, a gentleman uh, uh, holding his door shut, and a bear is trying to break into his cabin. And he has his drill, and he says, you know, screaming out, "Hey, I need more power!" And, and then then they flip over to his beachcomber older gentleman and he's out with his metal detector uh, collecting uh, you know necklaces off the beach and and he says I need more energy and and, and that kind of uh, portrays exactly what the difference is you need power when you need high current like a drill motor has you need to be able to deliver instantaneous current to that motor in order to get the torque you need on it through and that's what a power cell is uh, on the other flip side, the energy cell is exactly what the gentleman wanted. He wants to be out on that beach all day with his metal detector. Well, we all know metal detectors draw very, very low, uh, little current. And so current and power is not important to him, but uh, a very long um, uh, day out on the beach collecting collectibles is important. And that's where energy cells come in. And then sometimes we have a hybrid of both. And normally that, uh, that develops into a larger battery. Um, and also, 
one thing that's important is a lot of people overlook is uh, we, we do a little sanity test early on. It's like, okay, the customer comes to us with this uh, application and they say they need need the power. And and we, we look at it and, and they say, okay, I need this battery that fits in the palm of my hand. And it has to power New York City in midsummer with all the air conditioning inside. I mean, we kind of look at each other and kind of chuckle a little bit at, at the absurd request that this person has. But who's to say that in the future that may be possible? Because if you look at it, simply 10, 15 years ago, when um, lithium ion came onto the scene, they were mainly using laptops and cell phones, pretty low power devices. And all the power drills were nickel metal hydride and some NICAD, they were getting phased out back then. And the power cell was nickel metal hydride, not lithium ion. And if somebody asked me the question that at that time, hey, uh, I want to go ahead and power my as my drill with this lithium ion, uh, I heard it's brand new, great technology, I would have probably chuckled at that request as well because it was kind of ludicrous at that time to even think about applying this uh, lithium ion energy cell in a power application. So things do change, and it's a little sandy uh, check, and we keep up yearly. We go to a lot of the battery shows and keep up with technology, and we can convey that information to the customer on what the latest and greatest is. So we're we're a wonderful resource uh, when it comes to that. This slide here um, is one that a lot of people aren't aware of. It's if you look at the grand scheme of things, um, lithium ion and almost all battery chemistries actually operate in a very narrow window compared to what's absolute zero and, and the temperature of the sun. It's a very narrow window, it's like around minus 40 C if you're lucky, maybe minus 20 up to 60, 70 degrees C. And that's a pretty narrow range because a lot of electronics can operate, uh, especially on the high side, well outside that. Um, we actually look at uh, the requirement and, and try to address the concerns. Is the application mostly used in the winter or is there a requirement that at minus 40 or minus 20 that, you, that there's energy available, uh, that energy is going to be extracted from the battery? Well, there's not much available. And so we can look at perhaps adding heaters, which we've done many times, to help bring the cells back up to uh, at least a more reasonable temperature. And then that way you can extract available energy from the cells. And also on the high side, we have to put some of the heat spreaders in and some thermal conductive materials to help keep the cells close to the high ambient and not allow internal heat buildup to exceed the, uh, the cell rating. So you know, but yet still have your application be able to operate at very high temperatures. Uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes in uh, when batteries have to work outside these uh, temperature extremes. And usually these are more outdoor applications, not uh, benign like hospital environments. Right now, we'd like to cover some of the cost drivers that go into a battery uh, and, and why some batteries are maybe a little bit more expensive than others. If you look at the, the basic cells themselves, for the most part, uh, relatively speaking, they're fairly inexpensive. And, and, and so you, you have to ask yourself, what makes the battery so expensive if the cells are inexpensive? If you look at First of all, we look at how many cells are you looking at. If this is a large EV battery, you have a lot of inexpensive cells times a lot of cells equals expensive. <laughs> so you you got to look at this and it, don't ignore how many cells are in pack because regardless, if you have a lot of cells in there, your batteries will be expensive. And also, um, the type of protections. When you start getting into more elaborate batteries, larger um, type batteries, or you have batteries that uh, have multiple batteries within a system, but then you've got to uh, look at the protection circuits, how they interact with each other, what's required. There's a lot of cost there, uh, just the protection that's required to make all these uh, uh, batteries uh, uh, interact uh, correctly and, and play friendly together. And also, another cost driver is a quality of cell. Is this a medical device um, or maybe a military device where uh, performance far outweighs the cost? Well, then you want a very high, uh, high-end, uh, tightly controlled type uh, cell, and those are more the tier one type suppliers. But those don't fit in some of those consumer products, or let's say you have a product that you have to compete with your competitor, and they're a fairly inexpensive device, and the performance is secondary, 
hey, if it doesn't have quite as much runtime, that's okay. If it doesn't, you know, uh, work through all the temperature extremes, that's okay. They don't need to use it in the sunshine. You know, if there's some of those type trade-offs, then the tier two is a very viable option because it allows you to be competitive out in the marketplace and have a viable product and be able to sell it. If you put the tier ones in there, it'll just be sitting on the shelf. And then sometimes uh, the power rating and energy rating of the cells as well comes into play. Uh, that varies a lot. That's more application-based, um, and those are treated on a quote-by-quote um, -quote basis. The um, physical geometry and how they sit within the battery is sometimes one of the largest cost drivers. A lot of people don't think about it, but you know, we've seen many times where a product works great, plugged in the wall, they're all happy with the product, and then the CEO comes back or the head of marketing and says, hey, great product, now make it portable. Big problem here, because what happens is there's no space in the battery. And then so we get together with the engineers and say, hey, there's a little nothing uh, panning here, you can put a cell in over here, we can put another one and shove one in the behind over here. Well, that becomes a assembly nightmare for the pack assembler. Uh, your battery becomes extremely expensive. You got wiring, you got uh, logistics issues, how do you ship and what have you. It's not a compact, nice uh, solution. And so uh, if, if there's even a hint that your product could be portable in the future, make sure you leave a little bit of room or a space where uh, a battery could easily fit within that location. Maybe consult it ahead of time, uh, give you a rough idea what dimensions that you would need for the type of runtime you're looking at. Once you give us how much uh, current, how much load is being drawn, pretty important um, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, the packs, when they're really nice, like the picture off here to the left side of the uh, uh, the battery there, very um, economical heat uh, heat shrink pack. Normally we do those when they're embedded embedded permanently in the product. They can't be dropped or consumer replaced. And then uh, the one on the left is more robust, it's kind of like your drill battery where you can swap them out in the field. You don't care if the customer drops it on occasion. Um, and, and so they, uh, you've got it's actually some upfront costs if you go with a plastic enclosure, uh, tooling, what have you. So. You, they're definitely more expensive, but uh, they meet the need if you have to waterproof it, if it has to be uh, submersible or even a uh, lesser degree. Sometimes a plastic enclosure, especially if there's drop tests, are very important uh, uh, to consider. Another cost driver that's a pretty major factor is uh, all the electronics enclosed. Well, by default, the lithium ion has safety circuits, so you're going to have a circuit board. Other chemistries uh, may not. So uh, the most common would be perhaps some fuel gauging uh, that tells you capacity, what have you, what's in the battery. Integrated charger. We do that a lot of these on medical devices, where they absolutely do not want a, a charger, the uh, wrong charger, to be applied to the battery. So they grab it off the shelf, and then the battery gets damaged. With an integrated charger, you just apply power and the charger was, is always mated with the battery and always treats that battery with a lot of respect. It treats it with, uh, when it charges within its uh, cell uh, parameters that are acceptable by the cell manufacturer. So there's a, definitely a, a strong need out there, but usually it's for uh, the higher end products because you gotta keep in mind, if you have an embedded charger and your cells are depleted and they're, they're aged and you need to throw the battery out, good chance you're gonna be throwing out a perfectly good battery charger. So uh, something to keep in mind, uh, the recurring costs can be quite high with that type of application. Uh, also, uh, we sometimes put uh, customer electronics in the battery. Sometimes they don't have enough room on the board. Or they want the electronics more intimate with the battery for whatever reason. Uh, we can put some hooks in there, electric hooks, and, and be able to uh, allow that to, to happen. So uh, anything's possible here. Uh, another um, cost driver that a lot of people overlook is the connector, especially in the really high power, high current applications. Um, some of these connectors, especially in the military applications, can be hundreds of dollars. So th that can exponentially drive your cost up. So it's something to factor in on, on how, what type of connectors um, that will be utilized for your application. Uh, other areas are you know, built in inrush protection. Some customers have very high capacitive loads. When you plug in the battery, you don't want to be tripping safety circuits, so we can put inrush protection in that slowly charge with the load, then uh, your system, when it gets up to a certain voltage, activates. 
built-in fan, uh, we've got thermostats in there, all sorts of electronic devices um, to help uh, ease the uh, equilibrium of temperature throughout the battery pack. I'd like to touch a little bit here on safety and protection. First off, uh, a lot of people don't understand that all chemistries to some degree require protection. Uh, for instance, uh, all chemistries can overheat when shorted, and that's why we have a fuse link under every hood of every car in this country, in the world. Uh, even lead acid batteries uh, can be damaged severely if they're shorted out. So you definitely want some sort of fusing with all chemistries. Uh, nickel, nickel metal hydride, you name it, you need to be protected. Also, um, all chemistries can overheat during charge. Uh, you know, uh, obviously lithium ion is much more severe when it overheats during charge than other chemistries. Others can just melt down. And um, and I actually had experience back in the 90s with that and had one in, in our lab, a nickel metal hydride uh, kind of melt down, but it definitely helped. It got rid of all the salespeople in the room. <laughs> Uh, pretty, it can be pretty traumatic. Uh, with lithium ion, speaking of traumatic, <laughs> lithium ion can be more than all the others combined. Um, most important thing with lithium ion is you got to pre uh, prevent it from overheating. Our first line of defense is uh, we prevent, um, and if you look at the picture off to the side, we have connectors, some uh, cabling, and, and that's uh, safety circuits on there. And what we do is we make sure that wiring is sized correctly, the right connector is, is uh, applied to low uh, uh, resistance on the contacts. Uh, we get on the board and off the board as quickly as possible. We don't run heavy currents through the traces of the board. And the traces we do have on the board are fairly thick and wide. Uh, we use low RDSN on sets. Well, our sense resistors are as low ohmage as possible and still be accurate. So the first line of defense is prevent the heat from ever being generated through IR losses, in which we do. And then the heat that is left over, we want to make sure that it's dissipated correctly. A good example with this battery, if you look at it, it looks kind of like an eight-pack of beer or something. Um, it, that's mechanically configured correctly, where if you put this in any sort of enclosure or shrink wrap, all the heat from the cells are going out uh, the outside outside world, and and they're not, uh, and they're all equally um, at the same temperature, and therefore they all age equally. Um, back when uh, earlier slide I mentioned about handshaking system integration, this is a very good example of that. Where let's say that this battery is put in a product, and you have this microprocessor right next to the battery on one side of it, generating a huge amount of heat. All the cells, the closest ones, would be very, very hot. The ones on the opposite side be cool. That's a thermal gradient in a pack that's not acceptable. And there's a lot of ways of, um, of addressing that. And uh, a lot of times we'll wire them up a certain way. For instance, if this was a four series and two parallel pack, we would parallel up uh, the ones behind and ones in front. And that way they all age at the same rate. And, uh, and that works quite nicely. But we, that's where we really need to understand your system and where does the battery live within your system. Very, very, very important from a heat uh, perspective. And, uh, I can't stress it enough, it's extremely important. Um, also, then we uh, have protection there. We don't let cells uh, go under voltage, uh, so we do put under voltage protection. This can be a, a cycle life issue. Your battery won't last very long. Sometimes a safety issue. Uh, very important uh, to prevent the cells from being overly discharged. Uh, also protection um, for charging and discharging outside allowable parameters. We refer to data sheets from the manufacturers and from the cell manufacturers, and we make sure that voltages don't exceed the parameters in the data sheets. We make sure the currents don't, because they have limits on how fast you can charge and how fast you can discharge. We make sure that, that everything's within the acceptable allowable limits along with temperature. Uh, a lot of times the temperature, we send signals out to our, uh, to our battery chargers and um, so the charger uh, is in a, a inhibit mode if it's outside the temperature range. It's a very important uh, uh, for, from a safety uh, perspective. And also a couple of uh, industries, medical, IT, they require more of a secondary protection where let's say that your primary protection is uh, that sense voltage and turn off the battery as needed and also currents. Then the secondary is a separate IC, separate FETs, separate everything, sometimes a fuse. And that... Uh, that in itself will protect the battery in the event you have a gas order joint, that fails, who knows what. 
Um, in fact, we have on our uh, webinar site, I did a whole presentation on just secondary protection uh, just recently, I think uh, a couple of years ago, recently for me. <laughs> so uh, be sure to check that out on our, on our blog or our website, I should say. Uh, I'd like to touch a little bit on smart batteries. First of all, smart battery, what makes them smart? Well, they can uh, tell the outside world what's going on in, within the battery. Uh, the chemistries are um, usually nonlinear in nature, and there's a lot of things going on. They age, they, they act differently under low temperature over high temperature. So and a, a really smart battery will actually calculate all the different parameters for any instantaneous part, uh, time, uh, the current temperature, current use model, give you a uh, state of charge, it you know, uses battery voltage, you have access to that, cell voltage, individuals within the battery usually, depending on the IC, uh, charge and discharge currents, all this stuff's pretty important to use a lot of times. Battery temperature, very important. Uh, state of health, hey, is the, is the battery, how's the battery today on the last few charge cycles compared to when it was originally designed? Is it getting ready to be thrown out? Well, you have that data available to you. Also, running, uh, remaining runtime. Uh, pretty important. This is more of a dynamic parameter where let's say you have a load that sometimes it's a high load, sometimes it's a, you're pulling very little current, sometimes a lot of current. Anyway, that remaining runtime will vary a lot. And you've probably seen it on your phone where you can go into the energy saving mode and turn off apps and all of a sudden your, uh, your battery life shows many more hours than what you had minutes ago. Same concept here. That's actually what they use that parameter in your phone uh, to be able to calculate that. Uh, same with charge time, just the uh, direction of, of current flow. And there's hundred more, hundreds more parameters that are available um, that uh, under certain needs or circumstances that uh, could be quite useful. Uh, batteries also, um, they need to get their information out to the host. And this is normally done through ice for c or s and bus. And s and bus is essentially a, a subset of ice for c It's very similar. It has 100 kilohertz limit, things like that, some block stretching, pretty similar. Um, you know, a lot of times they're almost universal. You, know, uh, you can uh, you know, use both of them, I guess, and you know, no, they both work the, um, interchangeably sometimes. But you got to be a little careful that other uh, ice for c devices aren't on the bus. Um, it just complicates things when you have when you start mixing the SM bus as well. And also, um, single wire communication, a lot of TI parts have that. And, that comes in handy when you have like a three pin connector and you just have no, and you're trying to make something maybe almost backwards compatible, maybe turning a thermistor wire into a communication wire and the product's been existing for years and you just don't have any flexibility. And that's when we resort to single wire type communication. Also, I don't, I don't have out here listed, you know, like CAN bus, so that's a possibility. And I know a lot of Epic's competition, they use uh, another form of signaling smoke signals. Um, they, uh, we, Strongly recommend never to use them. They, but it does. Uh, battery does convey its state of uh, charge when, when smoke's coming out of it. So, but Epic doesn't do that. The um, smart batteries as well. Um, they can interface with some of the added electricity or added circuitry, I should say, um, like built-in chargers. We can extract data from the field gauges, help uh, make change some parameters on the chargers. Uh, in real time as cells age, maybe increase voltage over time, uh, help get a little extra, you know, squeeze a little bit more water out of that rock. Um, also, customer electronics sometimes will interface, put their electronics on, maybe have to uh, attach to the ice c line so they can communicate and see what's going on as well. Extract data on the battery, uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, the built in fan, integrate uh, heaters, uh, we can use the electronics on the battery to help send information to these devices to turn them on, turn them off as needed. So uh, you can add a lot of extra electronics, wrap it around uh, on top with smart aspects of just the data aspects of the battery, but also be able to add control as well. So I'd like to summarize what we've just covered here. Um, first of all, the most important thing, and that's why it's number one on the list, is the specification. More times than not, I've been doing this a long time, uh, without good, well-written spec, um, projects are all late and they're not delivered on time and they're usually disappoint the customer because the first word is, I thought. <laughs> well, that eliminates that I thought statement uh, because if it's all documented, all written down, then there's no problem. 
So once in a while, uh, there is some guesswork, especially if you if you're developing a brand new system that doesn't exist in the marketplace. It's new to you. Um, a lot of times, there's you take your best stab at what's required, and uh, sometimes you're off. Uh, and and we understand that that we're R and D and we expect change. And so uh, once you get a prototype and you start beating it up, and maybe you realize that something was overlooked or our assumption is uh, not really true, and, and and so we need to you know, revisit and so maybe making some changes. No problem. Uh, we we'll just update the spec, look at costs and schedule impacts, and, and convey that back. So again, there's no surprises, and um, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and make any modifications that's necessary. But uh, specification is it has to be done, and then you know what to tweak uh, when you when you have this um, essentially blueprint in hand. Also, um, fully understand your physical environmental requirements. If you don't know them, work with your marketing department. Uh, understand really, don't assume where this is going to be used. Sometimes um, uh, they have different thoughts than the engineers, and so it's really important to you know, bring all that together in one place. They have it documented. Also, understand your cost drivers. Uh, they can put you out of business if, if um, you want every bell and whistle, and your market can't uh, can't bear it, and your competition will undercut you. Um, take what you need, uh, take the minimum, um, and then, but then again, maybe your product, you need a lot more that uh, maybe outpace your uh, competition. Uh, your marketing department uh, would be the judge of that, what, what's really needed. But just keep in mind, it, it all has cost. And then another item is you really need to know what the safety systems and what, what which ones are in place. And it's really our job to put those in place, but it's also it's very important that you understand what they are because your customers are going to come back, and after seeing the headline news of a lithium-ion fire, they're going to come back to you and say, "Hey, what, what are you doing to protect our battery?" So uh, it's really it's really important that you understand what we're putting in place, and we can work with you on on, on the, making sure that's clearly understood. Uh, also, the operating parameters uh, need to be uh, provided to the outside world. Um, keep in mind, you, you have hundreds of parameters available to you. Don't use them all. <laughs> you know, use the ones that are important. You know, you've got charge time, maybe remaining uh, run time, uh, some voltage temperatures. You know, that's about it. Don't go in there and start extracting every ounce of data from every register. You're going to bog down your bus. You're going to create potential errors. Um, it just uh, it creates issues. Uh, just make sure you only use what, what's needed and nothing more. Um, and also, uh, Keep in mind all the additional electronics. It, of course, it adds cost. Um, some of it might be justified because of your market uh, and, and your need, and it, maybe your product wouldn't even sell without it. So, um, but just keep in mind, it's, it's a candy store, and we can add the sky's the limit. And that, that I strongly discourage that you do that. Only stay within what, what's important. You know, Epic does offer a, a number of other products and services. So I like to have the, hand this back over to Ed and so he can cover some of the other Epic's uh, products. Thanks, Randy. You're going to look over some of those questions and uh, answer them uh, that uh, in a minute or two. So really quickly, um, you know, Epic's been around for over 65 years, and uh, our business has been built on built to print uh, and designed to print products, as you can see here. Everything's really been based upon a printed circuit board. But we've been doing this for over 65 years. Our battery pack business is our fastest growing group right now, as we not only design uh, products uh, through our development group outside of Denver, um, but we also manufacture here in the U.S. and in lower cost regions as well. So we've got a lot of experience, especially when it comes to things like shipping and receiving lithium batteries. You know, that's a really high risk uh, operation. You got to have trained people. Um, we even do fulfillment services for some customers because you know they don't want to have to take batteries back and ship batteries out of their devices. So. Something that we've got a lot of experience in, along with many of these other products here. It does help that on the battery pack, there's print circuit boards, there's usually a user interface, like a fuel gauge with a, with a button on it. And in many of our battery packs, we have to put flexible heaters because of the fact that they operate in, uh, in lower temperatures. So having said all that, um, I'll turn it back over to Randy to go over some of the questions that, that came in. All right. Thank you, Ed. All right. Now, let's go through that while Ed was... Um Giving an overview here of what Epic uh, provides. The um, one of them here, actually, it's a very good question. That's one I should have put on the presentation, but failed to do so. Um, 
the question is, uh, is it uh, true that lithium-ion batteries uh, need to be DOT certified uh, before they can be shipped? And doesn't this add uh, cost? Isn't it a cost factor as well? And, um, yeah, th that is absolutely correct. Um, in fact, that's uh, uh, a lot of times limited, uh, limits uh, some of the uh, lithium-ion applications. The, um, all the lithium-ion batteries uh, do have to go through a UN38.3 test. Uh, they need to pass, and and uh, a lot of times this will add a few thousand dollars uh, cost um, uh, to run all these tests. But in, in a nutshell, for those that don't understand UN 38.3, it, it, it's essentially um, required because it emulates what a battery could be potentially exposed to during the shipping process. They could care less about how the battery runs or operates or anything like that. They just want to make sure the box doesn't catch fire on a UPS plane. And some of the tests that uh, there's essentially eight tests that they go through. Uh, there's uh, altitude simulation uh, tests. Um, if I recall, there's some temperature uh, tests as well. I know they shake and bake it. Um, uh, the vibration, they kind of emulate a, a, a truck driving down the road. Um, and so anything that you, you would expect, uh, let's say that uh, they also do altitude tests, but let's say a, a plane um, uh, loses oxygen at high altitude. They actually make sure that the electrolyte doesn't come out of the cells because they are, that material is extremely flammable and could catch fire. Uh, in the event a, a package was damaged, uh, they run it through short circuit tests, make sure a fusing is intact, that the battery doesn't ca overheat or catch fire. So essentially, they simulate um, uh, transportation of the battery, something damaging the packaging, that sort of thing. So, um, uh, I, I'm all for it. I, I think it's a great addition and, um, uh, to keeping everybody safe. And, uh, but yeah, I, I failed to put that in the presentation and that's a, a definitely a great call. So let me see here. And then we've got another one in here. Got to pick and choose here. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's, a, here's a, actually a good one. Um, it was, goes back to the beginning of my uh, career in batteries. Um, um, does anybody does anybody still use nickel metal hydride cells or batteries? Um, yes, actually, um, for that reason that I just mentioned about the UN testing, um, uh, lithium or nickel metal hydride does not need to go through UN testing. Um, very very large packs of some um, uh, stimul you know, uh, stipulations on that, but um, yeah, they're extremely large. Um, and if if weight is not a factor because they do weigh quite a bit more than lithium ion. Um, they can actually be a much better solution for getting time to market. You can beat your competition using uh, using the batteries. Um, a couple things to keep in mind um, is not only that they're heavier, but one thing uh, when lithium ion came onto the scene, I was extremely happy that the charge profile or characteristics are opposite of nickel of base chemistries. Reason being, um, nickel uses constant current, and then you're looking for like a little uh, uh, like a little peak on your voltage, and you have to have enough current for that peak to be defined enough, and that's how you terminate charge. And if you miss it, then the battery starts to get very warm, like the one on my desk, and we're all salespeople went running, but um, if you miss that peak, that happens, and so you have to have timers. But what's really difficult is almost all our applications have lithium-ion batteries uh, being charged while they're being used. Um, they, uh, lithium ion has a very similar charge profile as a uh, lead acid battery where you're using a constant voltage with current limit. And what's really nice is um, as long as that voltage you don't exceed that max, you can be discharging, charging. Eventually, when no load's on, the, the, the current to the battery would be very, very low. And um, if it stays that way, then we terminate. We never leave a trickle charge on a lithium-based uh, product. But we, um, it's really easy to be able to run your load and charge at the same time with lithium-based nickel metal hydrates. It's very, very difficult to be able to charge your battery and be full, and pulling uh, energy out of the battery at the same time. So um, that's one major drawback of, of the nickel metal hydride uh, batteries. And let's see here. Got, uh, let's see here. Um, oh, yeah, this is a good one. Um, now, this question here is just uh, adding electronics on a battery, doesn't it cause it to drain faster? And uh, intuitively you say, well, yeah, you slap on a whole bunch of <laughs> circuits on a battery and 
uh, you, you think that it's going to be a burden to, to the cells and they'll discharge in one day. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, it depends on, on the type of um, electronics you're adding. For instance, if you're putting a battery charger, uh, embedding it into the, uh, in, into the battery, then uh, it's getting its source of power mainly from the uh, wall brick, the external power, and it's going to be used to charge a battery. But we have to be very, very aware of the type of components that we use because when it's not plugged in the wall, we don't want the battery discharging into the circuitry of the battery charger, and that would drain the battery uh, quite rapidly. And uh, we pay close attention to the type of dials we use for blocking, if, if we use that or FET, um, like Shockies are notorious for extremely high reverse leakage currents. Uh, standard dials are, are not. They, they are maybe in the 5 nano amp range, so they have really, really nice reverse blocking currents. So those are those are tech things we're very cognizant about during the design process. Uh, other areas, um, sometimes we have to put microprocessors on board. Uh, uh, translators for, let's say, the LEDs um, don't like the LED function the way the, the IC presents it. So we can uh, essentially read that information and um, translate it into any type of display. And this is very useful, like if you're trying to make a product backwards compatible, you have to set, you know, thousands of your original product out in the field and when you push the button, the LEDs look a certain way and they respond to certain timing, um, you know, sequence and blaze, whatever it is, we can uh, essentially uh, mimic that uh, by translating what, what the ICs uh, are telling us and put that in a pick processor and then uh, be able to display the exact same way. So then it's seamless from a marketing department. Uh, they don't realize that it's a new generation battery because it looks, looks the same. Uh, little things like that, but it, it, when we do that, then we also have to put circuitry in. So when when the button's not pushed and it's inert, that we remove power from those those pick processors because they have sleep modes um, and, and wake ups in them in themselves in the micro amp. I think they're like one down to 1.6 microamps now, um, and they too can be extremely low. So um, it's a very good question because if you're not aware of what you're doing and how you're doing it and how you're applying it. To the battery, then yeah, your battery could deplete rather quickly, and um, and so that's that's uh, that's uh, something that I definitely consider, consider. So anyway, I think uh, that's it uh, on the questions. I want to thank everybody here on um, for joining us today. Uh, real enjoyable, and uh, if, uh, hopefully you have a lot more questions for us. Uh, please. Put them, uh, uh, submit them, and as Ed said, we'll make sure every single one is uh, addressed and, and returned with an answer.